All right, so we now know that John the Baptist water baptism, which is symbolic of something, is not the same as Holy Spirit baptism. And because it's differentiated in Scripture in a number of places. So John the Baptist, Baptist testifies <laughs> here that the Messiah, whom he announced as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, John 1, 20, 129, we're looking at here, and John 3, 22 to 30. John the Baptist testifies here that the Messiah whom he announced as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, John 1, 29, is here, physically present in his perfect humanity. Hamashiach, Messiah, Christos, ready to usher in his kingdom. Our Lord also preaches to, the, to and water baptizes individuals of Israel alone not the Gentiles, so that they would repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. In other words, if they all believed, repent unto believing, the kingdom of God would commence at that point. And all the, the uh, prophesying about Jesus' propitiation for our sins would occur at that time in the first century, which the propitiation did occur. But the postponement of the kingdom, because all Israel didn't believe, was sadly present, and the intercalation of the church of 2,000 years is ongoing now, getting towards its end, and it obviously hasn't fulfilled its perfect purpose either. Messiah's kingdom is imminent, and only awaits Israel's changing its mind and accepting Christ as Savior and Messiah. And moving on to point H, Israel finally is delivered at the second advent. God didn't give up on Israel. Although Israel is not God's chosen people at this time, a new generation will be. So Israel finally is delivered at the second advent of Christ by a divinely provided fountain of cleansing and outpouring of the Holy Spirit to lead individual Israelites to repentant faith in Jesus as their Messiah. Take a look at Zechariah 12, 10, and 13, 1. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. That's not the church a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me, the one whom they have pier had pierced back in the first century, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve, grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. And 13.1, On that day a fountain will be opened to the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and impurity. So it's by the grace of God he will enable that to occur. Bible Knowledge Commentary. Israel's spiritual deliverance at the second advent of Christ, the second coming, will be accomplished only by a divinely provided foundation of cleansing, 13.1, and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit to lead individual Israelites to repentant faith in Jesus as their Messiah. This is the fulfillment of the new covenant, which hasn't been abrogated, hasn't been uh, instituted nor fulfilled at, to this point. All the way back to Jeremiah and Ezekiel. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit, both leaders, the house of David and commoners of the inhabitants of Jerusalem, thus excluding no Israelites, will be the objects of the outpouring of the divine spirit of grace and supplication. This is most probably a reference to the Holy Spirit, so-called because he will minister graciously to Israel in her sinful condition and will lead her to supplication and repentance. The mourning of the nation Israel. Thus Israelites will receive divine enablement to look on me, the one whom they have pierced. The Lord refers not to the nation's action of piercing him, a term usually indicating piercing to death. The piercing evidently refers to the rejection of Christ as God incarnate and crucifying him, though the word does not specifically refer to the crucifixion. The implication is there. The looking could be either physical vision, sight, or spiritual vision, faith. Probably it refers here to both. For this will occur at the second advent, of Christ when Israel will recognize at that moment her Messiah and turn to him. After all the historical references, the Jews are still steeped in their history and they will recognize that in that time, which is shortly but yet future. The change to the third person mourn for him rather than mourn for me is common in prophetic literature. The mourning for sin <clears throat> that is prompted by the outpoured spirit is illustrated by a private, private act of mourning, verse 10, and a public act of mourning, verse 11. The loss of an only child or of a firstborn son 
was aggravated by the felt curse associated with childlessness and the lack of an heir to continue the family name and property. Let's see if I can bump on over to the New Covenant. Add a new site here. This is precisely predicted in the, new, in the Old Testament in Jeremiah. Look under the New Covenant. I did a, a survey of this because there are a lot of conflicts and contradictory thoughts about this subject. So you have to take one passage at a time and you start with the Old Testament and then see how it is corroborated in the New, which I did. I was warned not to do it this way, but that's the way it appears in the Bible. I have to follow the order of the way it was written and not somebody's personal advice. The New Covenant in detail. You may look up Jeremiah. It's 31. There it is. Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, days are coming, and they're still coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. With whom? Then say the church there. Two houses, with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. At that time, they were separated. And we have a number of cross-references. You can check it out. The next verse, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day of my taking them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. Which covenant is that? The law, the Mosaic law, my covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. Has that happened yet? No. In the sense of within their minds, and on their heart I will write it as, as well. It's a figurative speech for the mind. And I will be their God, and they, will, they shall be my people. Hasn't happened yet. Matter of fact, to the point of Isaiah says, you're no longer my people. But then immediately the next verse in Hosea says, but you will be my people, a new generation. That hasn't happened yet. And they will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother. Why? Saying, know the Lord, for they will all know me. They don't need to ask. They know it perfectly because the Lord God will put it in them. From the least to them, to the greatest to them, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. So, okay. So this is the new covenant. We have this fulfilled in Ezekiel as well, but we've uh, departed from the, let's go back to the original text here. So we finish with that, take a look at that study and find out how the new and the Old Testament and the new covenant corroborate one, uh, one another perfectly. Israel, uh, the, the church is not the new Israel. We have our own dispensation and the Jews have theirs and they will be fulfilled precisely as, as the... Uh, the scriptures predict now the water baptism of Jesus. We don't get water baptized like Jesus did. We don't identify with his mission. I'm not here to die for the sins of the whole world. We're here to identify with what Jesus did. So the water baptism of Jesus symbolized his identification with his mission of providing salvation for the world and establishing his messianic kingdom upon the earth. Matthew 3, 13 to 17. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by him, and, you do, not, and, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, Let it be, no, be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Now that will be explained as we keep reading. Sometimes you don't understand something, so keep reading. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he, John the Baptist, who related this through his disciple, disciples, the apostle John, Andrew, and Peter, etc., and Matthew the apostle who wrote this passage, and he, John the Baptist, saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. So what did the water symbolize in the case of the baptism of Jesus? Could that be my kind of water baptism when I was water baptized? The water in this case represented the Father's will for Jesus Christ, not for me, which was his mission of providing salvation for the world and establishing the messianic kingdom upon the earth. Context is what? 
John the Baptist announced him, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He say saying that about me. This is not my water baptism. This is the unique one of the Lord Jesus Christ alone. So John was at first reluctant. John the Baptist was at first reluctant to water baptize our Lord because Jesus was the Messiah, and he knew that, and he recognized it and announced it. Others were being baptized in order to be identified with him as Messiah. John knew that Jesus did not need to be baptized in that way. He was the Messiah himself. So answer, Jesus answered John's reluctance by explaining. Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Now we get the idea. So John, Jesus said to John, It is an act of fulfilling all righteousness that I should take up at your hands this baptism with this water representing my Father's plan, God the Father, my Father's mission for me as Savior of the world and fulfiller of the Messianic promises to the Jewish people. That's the context. And then John says, Now that I understand that kind of baptism I can indeed perform upon you. And so John took the Lord and he baptized him in identification with his particular and unique, once for all kind, his mission to the cross and to the nation of Israel and the kingdom. That's symbolic of his actual identification a baptism of the cross for the sins of the whole world, for the sins were put all upon him. Our Lord's water baptism therefore symbolized his mission, which was to die on the cross for the sins of the whole world and then be raised from the dead in victory over sins. So on the other hand, believers' water baptism, well, I've heard this, symbolizes an actual Holy Spirit baptism, the latter of which is an actual identification with and appropriation of forgiveness of sins as a result of Christ's death to pay this penalty for our sins. Now you become a believer by believing. Then you get water baptized. So your faith is what activated that Holy Spirit baptism. And thereafter, your water baptism symbolizes that actual Holy Spirit baptism. So believers have been buried with Christ at the moment of faith alone and Christ alone through Holy Spirit baptism, which is symbolized by their water baptism. They're unique, not Christ's water baptism, but your own particular water baptism based on your own experience of having expressed a moment of faith alone in Christ alone for the forgiveness of your sins. So, compare Romans 6, 3 to 4. Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized, in other words, identified with the results of his death? And therefore, we have been buried with him, Jesus Christ, through baptism into his death, in order that as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. So just as our Lord's immersion into water by John the Baptist symbolized his death on the cross for the sins of the whole world, and his burial, and his coming up out of the water symbolized his resurrection, so the believer's water baptism, his own immersion, symbolizes the believer's death, burial, and resurrection with Jesus having already received forgiveness of sins, as a result of a moment of faith in our Lord and what he did for that believer on the cross. So, we do not and cannot follow our Lord in water baptism, as some many contend. On the other hand, it is incorrect for one to state that they are following the Lord in water baptism. The only way you, one can follow Jesus Christ in baptism is the mode, the fact that he, is, he used water and was immersed. But one certainly cannot follow him in the meaning of that water in his, in his case. It was a unique baptism, only one of a kind, of its kind, specifically and exclusively assigned to him to die on the cross for the sins of the whole world. The water baptism by John of Jews was, of course, functioning before Jesus came on the scene. It was the purpose of Jesus Christ to have his herald, John, baptize him in order to signal the start of his particular public ministry. His water baptism wasn't the same as the one that was being performed by John the Baptist. So his mission at age 30. Jesus' mission at age 30. In John's baptism of Jesus, the water had a different meaning. Here the water represented the kingdom of God on earth, which Jesus Christ had come to rule, and his rule as king of the Jews. Furthermore, our Lord's water baptism represented his mission as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So when Jesus said, John, I want you to, to baptize me, Jesus was saying, I want you to place me in these waters which will represent my identification with my mission, symbolic, to be the messianic, messiah, messiah, savior, and to be the king of the Jews, 
and to set up the earthly kingdom which was promised to Abraham and then expected.